so much for your faithfulness this morning. We're going to go ahead and open up with a word of prayer, so let's go ahead and bow our heads, and let's close our eyes. Young people, listen. All right, let's go ahead and pray. Our Lord and Heavenly Father, we love you, and we're so thankful for the privilege to be in your house today, thankful for the opportunity to be able to celebrate the true meaning of Christmas, and I pray that you draw us closer to you through it. Thank you for the faithfulness of your people, but we think of those who are ill and traveling today, that you would touch them, give them safety, as well as those who are ill, bring them physical strength. We love you, Lord, and we ask all this now in Jesus' name. And all God's people prayed and said, Amen. Amen. I want to personally thank you so much for being here with us today. If you're visiting with us for the first time, restrooms are through that back door over there. The whole line's right around to them. Also, past those restrooms is our nursery, and so you're more than welcome to make use of that. After our service this morning, we're going to have a fellowship meal. Even if you didn't bring anything, please come join us. There's plenty of food down there, and we would love to have you enjoy that fellowship with us. And then for those of you who knew of it, uh, we're having a Christmas gift exchange after the fellowship meal. We're looking forward to enjoying that. And then, Lord willing, we're going to take the bus out after all of that, and we're going to go Christmas calling and caroling and deliver some cookies to some people as we sing to them. So we're calling it our all-day Christmas celebration. But before all that begins, our young people, our choir, and some special music people are going to come before you and present to you the true meaning of Christmas. We're going to begin by having Miss Chloe come and play a special on the piano.
Luke 1, 26 through 31. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath also, hath also conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month with her, who was called barren. And the angel departed from her. Matthew 1, 18 through 25. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken to the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is, God with us. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife, and knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus.
Luke 2, 1 through 5. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all should, the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, every one into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, Judea, under the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. Two, six through seven. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn.
Luke 2, 8 through 14. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Heaven's choir came down to sing when heaven's king came down to save. D.L. Moody. All right, before they come back again, let's go ahead and stand together, take our hymnals, and turn to 426. And I invite you to join in singing with us, Angels We Have Heard on High. Verse number one of Angels We Have Heard on High, 426. Let's sing together this wonderful proclamation song. Angels we have heard on high, sweetly singing o'er the plains and the mountains in reply, echoing their joyous strain.
Come to Bethlehem and see him whose birth the angels see. Come adore our bended knee, Christ the Lord, the newborn King. Oh, for the bucket this morning, okay? All right, let's sing together on the first verse. Then after you guys are done collecting money for the bucket, I want you right back where you are at, okay? Got it? All right, let's try it. 424, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Glory to the newborn King. Good. Thank you. 
And they came with haste, and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen, as it was told unto them.
members of Earl Town, all you faithful, thank you, choir. Thank you, young people. applause to all the young people in the choir did a wonderful job <clears throat> amen thank you so much for coming this morning we're going to take a moment to look into the word of God and understand a little bit more about this season so if you have your Bibles take them and turn to Isaiah chapter 9 and verse number 6 this is a very familiar story in the Word of God. It deals with a man of God who brought a message to a people on how they would know that there was a son that would be born to God and what he would come to do. See, we're not just talking about fairy tales. We're not dealing with Walt Disney. We're dealing with the Word of God. And as we look to the Word of God and its truth, it is awesome to understand the authority of the Word of God, the power of the Word of God, and what it has to say that can change your life. Let me ask you a question. A hundred years from now, how is someone going to know that you existed? Think about it. A hundred years from now, how will someone know that you, were exi that you existed? May it be that somewhere along the lines, and I don't know how technology is going to be, but may it be that somewhere throughout all the data of the technology age that they're going to pull up some type of feed from Facebook that was you. Could it be that they'll pull up some type of birth certificate that proved that you existed? Some form of written document that would state that you lived on this earth. You see, the Word of God is not just a book written by man. It's a book written with the tool of man by God about the Lord Jesus Christ and it's proof that He, Jesus, existed. As we look at Isaiah chapter 9 and verse number 6, the Word of God says, for unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Do you realize today that in the Word of God, the 66 books of the Bible, 39 books in the Old Testament, 27 books in the New Testament, with 1,189 chapters, do you realize that there's over 256 names for the Lord Jesus Christ? In the Christmas story, His name shall be called Jesus, for He shall save His people from their sins. Same story, His name shall be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. And here in Isaiah 9, in verse Verse number 6, we find a few more names for Jesus Christ. The titles given, Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, 
the Prince of Peace. And throughout this whole book here is a testament and a story of the one that came to do something great for you. Now maybe you've seen this picture. It goes with verse number 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Forgiven. This is the reason why the Lord Jesus Christ came. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. We still live in a culture in America where Christmas is important to some. But you do realize that there are countries out there in this world that do not care that Christ is exalted. And I say this, if we don't start caring, America will very quickly become a nation who stops caring about Christmas as well. This is why we celebrate the season, because of who Christ is, we can be forgiven of all of our sins. That's why Jesus Christ came. He came that you and I might know eternal peace, that you and I might have eternal life. And I'm so thankful today that in all my rottenness and in all my vileness, in all the error of my way, years before I ever existed, years before there was any written proof of me, God was. And God had a plan. And His perfect plan wrapped up in the love of Christ was given that day that we celebrate of the Lord Jesus Christ's birth. Now for many of us, we picture Christmas as a baby boy named Jesus. But when we look at Isaiah chapter 9 and verse number 6, you understand that this chapter is not just dealing with the birth of the baby boy. This chapter is dealing with His life, His death, His resurrection. Resurrection. Look at what it says in verse number 2. This is why he came. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shined. Do you realize that when you're left alone in your sin, without God, without the Lord Jesus Christ, without coming to Him, life is but the shadow of death. Death will compass you. Death will overcome take you because of the sin nature. But I'm here to tell you that there's a great light shining in 2015. Just like there was a great light that shined in that day, the light is still shining. And it's shining that you and I may be forgiven for unto us not just the people of God, the Israelites, for unto us not just those who name Judaism, for unto us every single person that has ever existed and has ever lived has had a son that's been given unto them. The question is, are we going to receive him? Now according to this verse, it says, verse 6, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. For those of you who know him today, you can say this, number one, most of all, the Lord Jesus Christ is wonderful. He's not someone that you make fun of. He's not something that you mock. He's not someone that you stay away from. If you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, He is wonderful to you. And you want more of Him. And you want to spend time with Him. And you want to be involved in the things that He would want you to be involved in because He is wonderful. For those of you who are involved in a marriage relationship, think about those days when you first got together with the one that you were to wed. And think about how wonderful it was back when everything was awesome. Back when the only thing that you could think of was, I want to be with her or I want to be with him. And you would do things gentlemen that you wouldn't normally have done. Normally you would have been in the tree stand. Normally you would have been kicking a football. Normally you would have been doing something manly. But now you're carrying bags walking down the mall because you're with someone that's wonderful. I tell you, when you get around the Lord Jesus Christ and find out how wonderful He is, He changes your life. 
Amen. Now, if you're a Christian, if you're saved here, not only is he wonderful to you, but look at chapter 9, verse 6 again. For his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. You realize today that you have someone greater than any psychiatrist that is. Someone that's greater than any advice of man. You have a counselor in God. You can go to him for advice. His word is pure. His word is true. His word is everlasting. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven and blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. A great peace have they which love thy law and nothing shall offend them. If you teach a wise man he will be yet the wiser but a fool will continue to be foolish no matter how much of this they have come in. God is the best counselor that any one of us could ever have. Now look at what it continues to say chapter 9 verse 6 His name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God. For you as a Christian, if you are saved, you profess something about your God. You profess that He is mighty. Mighty than any warrior that has ever existed. More mighty than any force that is out there. For Nahum says, The Lord hath His way in the whirlwind and in the storm. Listen friends, you've got a mighty God. He is mighty enough to split the Red Sea. He is mighty enough to take the sling and the stone out of David's hand and kill Goliath. He's mighty enough to cause the mouth of the lion to remain still and to remain shut while Daniel is in the lion's den. He is mighty enough to give seed to a virgin named Mary to bring forth his purpose and to bring forth his plan. We worship today the mighty God. The problem is most of us do not live like we have a mighty God. But Christianity professes, my Jesus is wonderful. My Jesus is my counselor. My Jesus is the mighty God. Look at what else it says. Not only is he the mighty God, but he is the everlasting Father. Some of you in here have faced the horrific event, the sorrowful event, the grief in your heart of losing someone. And maybe it was your earthly father. He is gone and passed away. Now thankfully you've got some memories. You can pull a picture out and instantly those memories are brought back of your daddy. You can look at things. You can remember what your daddy said and it could challenge you. It could bring a smile to your face or it may not bring a smile to your face. You could have memories about your father that impact you today, but earthly fathers always pass away. The one thing that's true about our God is he never passes away. He is the mighty God. He is the everlasting Father. You never have to worry about God forsaking you. You never have to worry about him running away. There's people who may have grown up with a daddy who wanted nothing to do with them. Daddy would work all week, spend all of his money that Friday night at the bar, come home flat broke, and the family had nothing. Coming home flat broke and drunk, he would begin to be abusive. He would begin to tear apart the house. And eventually, years down the road, Daddy may have left. Can I tell you, do not base your philosophy of God upon the what a man has done to you or a man has lived before you. But base who God is upon the word of God. He is the everlasting Father. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. And He's always good at being the best daddy there is. You know what the problem is? Jesus looked at the Pharisees. Jesus looked at the religious crowd. And Jesus said to the Pharisees in Judaism, Ye are of your father, the devil. There's many people who think God is their father. They do religious works. They're atheists. Whatever they may be, they think that they're all right. But in all reality, if they have never come before the Lord Jesus Christ, understood His salvation, repented of their sins, and believe the gospel, they have never been saved, and therefore they cannot claim, my God is the everlasting Father, and He's my Daddy.
Listen, church, if you're saved in here, not only is Jesus Christ not just the picture of the baby, but the adult version that died on the cross and rose again, the glorified Son of God, He is wonderful to you. He is your counselor. He is the mighty God for you. He is your everlasting Father. He'll never run out on you. He'll never mistreat you. He is a good daddy. Now look at the last thing about Him. For unto us a child is born... Unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, and here it is, the Prince of Peace. As a Christian at one point in your life You came underneath the fact That he would be the prince of peace for you When I think about the word prince I think about authority When I think about the word prince I think of leadership I think of rule Do you realize today That he is entitled the prince of peace Not just because he's the son of God But because he is the leader in peace He is the authority of peace He is the dictator of peace. And he will give his peace to whom is underneath his rule, his leadership, his dictatorship. And my friends, I'm telling you that when you come to Almighty God, there's a peace that passeth all understanding. But just like any enemy of any territory, any people group, or any nationality, we understand that the enemies of the cross will never have peace. The enemies of God will never have peace unless they put themselves underneath the authority of the Prince of Peace. I ask you a question. Have you given yourself over to God yet? Have you submitted yourself to His salvation? Have you given yourself to that wonderful, glorious God that has given everything to you? Look at this verse again as we seek to close this message. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. But do not let that confuse you concerning what the prophet's saying. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. The government was not upon the shoulder of Jesus Christ when he came the first time. The first time Jesus came, he came to be harmed. He came to be mocked. He came to be crucified. He came to be killed. What we are dealing with in Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6 is the second coming of Christ. That is still prophecy. That is still future. The first part, unto us a son is given. That's happened. But we are awaiting the second portion of that. For every Christian, you get to call him wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father and the prince of peace. Right now. But you do realize that one day. Even though there are those who reject them now. There will be a day where his name is called that. Across the board. As he reigns as the king. As he reigns as the Lord from Jerusalem. Look at what it says in verse number 7. Of the increase. The magnitude. The continual gain of his government. And peace there shall be no end. This is how we know we're dealing with a prophecy a later time than 2015 there's increase in his government there's peace that does not end and upon the throne of David upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and justice from henceforth even forever the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this Can I ask you a question? Does the word of God say the zeal of the Lord of hosts might perform this? It says the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Listen, friend, if you do not believe in Jesus Christ, if you've never given your life over to Him yet, you still have time to come into the rest of God. You still have time to stop wrestling with your sin. You still have time to be accepted as one of the beloved of God. You still have time. But there will come a day where regardless of what man thinks, the Lord Jesus Christ will set up His reign, His rightful reign as Almighty God. The Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, the Wonderful Counselor, and it will be from Jerusalem. Does it amaze you how that little piece of property over there in the Middle East continues to exist? Does that baffle you at all? Then we look to the book of Genesis and we realize 
that we are blessed if we call Israel blessed. We are cursed if we call Israel cursed. You better be careful how you handle Israel. Israel will continue. Israel will still be the place where our Lord sits one day and He reigns and rules forever and ever and ever and ever. So the message today is this. What a wonderful Savior. He was given to us that we might be forgiven. The Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Is a gift intended to be given and then taken away? No. You better believe that when God gave His Son to us, He did not intend to take His Son away from us. All those gifts out there that have been given under the tree, all those gifts that are downstairs for the gift exchange, they are given not to be taken back again, but given that it may be kept by you. The Lord Jesus Christ has been given that you may know eternal life. That you may have eternal peace. That you may have an eternal daddy that never passes away. That is always victorious and always reigns. And what a wonderful God we have today, church. My prayer is that the Christian wouldn't just be reminded of how awesome he is. My prayer is that someone who denies him today would say, Whoa. The Spirit of God would begin to tap on their shoulder and the Spirit of God would begin to say, you know your sin. And when you understand your sin before a holy God, there is none righteous, no, not one. You begin to realize the wages of sin is death and all of a sudden you are in a place where how can I be helped? Look at how wicked and how vile I am. And that's when the whisper of ultimate love comes by your way and says, for God so loved you, so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have what church? Everlasting life. I ask you this question. Do you have Jesus today? Do you have everlasting life? Is it heaven or hell for you? Is it the Savior or your sin? Something you need to think about. I can't force anyone to make a decision of faith. But that's something that you come to. And you humbly bow before your God. Unworthy, but yet Christ loved you so much he gave everything he saw worth in you. What a good God. So don't let this Christmas season take you away from what it's all about. It's all about that light that came to shine that you may know him. The power of his resurrection. The fellowship of his sufferings. It came that you might find the ultimate healing Healing that inner peace from humanity's perspective could never bring. Healing that any vitamin or any medicine could never bring. Healing that any friendship or family could never give. A healing of your sin that only He could give. And this is why He died. That we might be set free. This is why He arose again the third day. That we may be part of the resurrection and the life. Do you know Him? Are you living for Him? Let's pray. Our Lord, we come before You and we are sorry for how we mistreat You and how we abuse Your name. I pray that within this crowd and outside these walls we would see a greater respect for the holiness of God. I pray that we begin to see an increasing love for who You are. We love him because he first loved us and so Lord I really pray that you would help us to decrease that you might increase help us to come to that place where we submit ourselves to you Lord it may be that there's someone in this place that does not know for sure that they are saved there may be someone here that has wrestled with it there may be someone who's never heard of such a thing before but they've come underneath the sound of the gospel today I would pray that you would set them free As they come to you for salvation. Lord we love you. We ask this in Jesus name. The pianist is going to begin the play.
Bible says in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The question at hand, dear friend, is do you know for sure that Jesus Christ is your Savior? I mean, if you were to die this very moment, do you know that you would be pardoned into the gates of heaven? The Bible says in Psalm 51 and verse 5, David said, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity. In sin did my mother conceive me. In Ezekiel 18.4, the Bible says, The soul that sinneth, it shall die. In Romans 3 verse 10, the Bible says, There is none righteous, no, not one. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death. And in Revelation 20.14, And death and hell are cast into the lake of fire. A pretty bleak and hopeless future. But dear friends, the Bible says, But God commendeth His love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Do you understand that right now today you can know for sure, you can have this confidence that you will go to heaven the day you die if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. There was a man named the Philippian jailer. And when he cried out, what must I do to be saved? Paul responded back, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Dear friend, where will you spend eternity? If you'd like to spend eternity in heaven, the Bible says in Romans 10, For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Romans 10, 13 says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Will you cry out to God with me at this moment, knowing it's not the prayer that saves you, but dear friend, it's the Lord Jesus Christ that saves you. If you'd like to be saved, why don't you bow your head with me and pray these words. Dear God, I know I'm a sinner. And it's been shown to me today in the Word of God that my sin is going to take me to a place called hell. But Lord, I also understand today that the Bible says that Jesus Christ died so that I might live. Dear God, today I'm trusting in Jesus Christ and Him alone to take me to heaven. Thank you, Lord, for saving me from my sins. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Dear friend, if you've made a decision for the Lord Jesus Christ today, my wife and I would sure like to hear about it. Why don't you take the time to let us know? And may you glorify the Lord Jesus Christ by living your life for Him.